Hello everyone. In this lecture, I will discuss manufacturing, planning and control. Let's start with the definition. A manufacturing, planning and control system provides information and support which enables managers to efficiently direct the flow of material, manage the utilization of people and equipment, and respond to customer requirements by utilizing the capacity of suppliers, internal facilities, and in some cases, customers. Now this definition presents three important facets of manufacturing, planning, and control. The first relates to what exactly a manufacturing, planning, and control system is. Now we see here that it's actually a system which provides information and support. So that's an important feature of manufacturing planning and control. It's something which helps a company by means of information and by means of some support activities. Now, why do we need this? So this was what exactly manufacturing planning and control is. The next part of this definition describes why we need manufacturing planning and control. Now it enables managers to efficiently direct the flow of material. It's important in today's world to be able to direct the flow of material such that we make the products as and when customers require them. We also are looking at MPC to manage the utilization of people and equipment. We want to make sure that we are able to utilize the people and material resources to the most optimum level and thereby reduce cost and improve customer service. And by doing so, our expectation is that we are responding to all customer requirements at the most optimal way. Now how does MPC do all these things is what we see in the third part of this definition. It does it by utilizing capacity, which might reside at your supplier's location. It might be at the manufacturing plant itself. Or in some cases, we might also be looking at a customer's capacity to fulfill their own requirements. So that's, in a sense, what manufacturing planning and control system is all about. In fact, a manufacturing planning and control system is often a module in an ERP system, an enterprise resource planning system like SAP. It could be many other variants of it. Uh, and you will see that in today's business world, organizations are using enterprise resource planning softwares to manage an integrated business. Now, as a part of this presentation, I will go over several aspects of manufacturing planning and control. The first is to just present what is a simplified MPC framework. Then we will discuss important support activities of an MPC system. Next, we will understand the need for matching the MPC system to the requirements. As a fourth point, we will take a look at how MPC can be classified in terms of the number of units that a company might be producing and the duration within which these units have to be produced. Then we will consider the evolution of the MPC system over time. And finally, we will discuss some MPC driven performance indicators, because in the end, what really matters is that this MPC, the Manufacturing Planning and Control System, has helped an organization in improving performance. So what are the indicators that will tell us if that is the case? Now the MPC system can be divided into three parts. The top third in this figure is called the front end. 
and that is responsible for various activities that help in setting the overall direction of a manufacturing company. So this is where we are creating an overall game plan, our overall strategy, so to speak. The middle one third of the framework is referred to as the engine of the MPC system. This handles most of the detailed computation since this is where you know how many parts have to be made, how many parts and components have to be brought together for the product options. And that kind of calculation requires a large computational space within the manufacturing planning and control system, and hence the name, the engine. And finally, the bottom third is referred to as the back end. And it is the execution system which provides information regarding how various activities should be scheduled on the shop floor of the manufacturing company or how it should be scheduled at the vendor's site. Because a lot of times organizations are outsourcing their production and still they want the execution at the supplier's end to match with the requirements at the customer's end. So this execution system is in a sense the scheduling of different uh, activities that has to be done. This could be scheduling of people, scheduling of machine centers, and so on and so forth. Now this figure is an expanded view of what we saw in the previous slide. Now here we see the same three aspects, the front end, the engine, and the back end. Now let's start with the front end and discuss first the sales and operations planning module within the MPC. Now the sales and operations planning module is where we determine how the sales plan can be integrated with the operational plan, as the name itself suggests. Now, this is where the sales and marketing strategy has to be aligned with the operational resources and the operational strategy. Incidentally, even as of today, very few organizations have spent enough time and attention to ensure a seamless integration between sales and operations planning. And when an organization is devoid of such an integration, the problems percolate down in the chain and subsequently manifest in the form of lost sales, excess inventories, and so on and so forth. So this is a very critical operation within the manufacturing planning and control system, something which sets the overall strategy for the company. Now the manufacturing planning and control system relies on number one, the demand management, and number two, the resource planning module. Now, when we say demand management, it refers to forecasting, but it also refers to the idea of order taking, order promising, because at times companies are not working on forecast alone. They might be taking orders as and when an important customer comes up with something new as a requirement. Sometimes you have to promise an order to, to be competitive, and all of that falls within the demand management module. Once we have taken these action in demand management, that has to provide input to sales and operations planning so that the overall game plan can take into account any changes that might be there. On the other end, we also need to know what kind of resources do we have at the very high level, at the plant level, at the organization level, how much capacity do we have? 
there has to be a match between what kind of demand we are managing and how much resources do we have. So that would be the other input that is needed for sales and operations planning. Now when these two inputs have come in and sales and operations have understood their priorities and constraints, that results in a plan which now is for the finished products that have to be made. So the master production scheduling is a period by period plan for finished product or the options, the product options that we have to make. Because in many organizations, it's not appropriate to plan every single finished product that can be made because there could be infinite number of them, a very large number of them. And hence, what happens in these organizations is that they plan at the product option level, which is much more manageable. So that would be your front end, which is sales and operations planning, providing inputs to manufacturing planning and control. Now the manufacturing planning and control is a period by period plan for the finished products that have to be made, whether it's finished products or product options, but something which really has to be made to fulfill customer requirements. Once that plan has been made, that is the basis for detailed material planning. Now, the detailed material planning is where all the parts, components, subcomponents that go into the finished product has to be planned. So this is where, based on the product structure, also called bill of material, we try to understand what are the different parts that might be necessary to make the finished product and plan them accordingly. So that's where we come to this engine section, also referred to as MRP. Now that detailed material planning would be the basis for a detailed capacity planning. Unlike the resource planning that we saw up here, this is where the capacity planning is done at a much more finer level. We have to understand exactly how the different human resources, material resources, machine resources that we have will help us manufacture these parts. So that material planning which we have here and the capacity planning becomes the basis for the final material and capacity plans which is in turn sent out to the shop floor systems in case we are manufacturing ourselves or to the supplier systems if it has been outsourced to an external vendor, which is our backend. So this is our execution system where now the shop floor has to schedule all the resources so that the material that is needed for the finished product can be made once these materials have been made, that will be providing all the required inputs for the finished products and hence the finished products can be made. So it's a top-down planning, but then the execution of this would be the basis to be able to fulfill all the requirements that we have over here. Next, we look at some of the support activities that are part of the manufacturing planning and control system. We'll start with the long-term support activities. Now recall that the front end is our overall strategy as reflected in our sales and operations planning. So that's where our long-term planning has to happen. That's where our long-term support activities have to happen. So at this stage, what we are looking at is to ensure that appropriate amount of capacity, it could include suppliers' capacity, is available or not. We want to ensure that it's there. And then we also want to provide the appropriate mix of human resource capabilities, technology, and geographic locations. So this is where we are looking at a horizon which is greater than one year, maybe five years, to understand if what we want to do as an organization, 
do we have the necessary capability and capacity? So that would be the long-term support activities associated with manufacturing, planning, and control. Next, the intermediate term support activities, something which happens on a monthly basis within a year. Now here, the fundamental aspect that we have to focus on is how do we match the supply with demand? The supply of products that we have to manufacture and the demand that the customers are placing. Now what you'll see here is that it's not just the number of products that we have to make, but we have to also be cognizant of the product mix because customers might be looking at different configurations of a product. So we have to understand the right mix and right volume based on our existing capacity and the demand. So we have to plan different things at this stage on a monthly basis. We have to plan the logistics that we will have for all these activities that have to be done. We'll plan the appropriate inventory levels. What is our economic order quantity if it's something where we have a batch production? What exactly is the way we will create our inventory plans? Is it a periodic plan? Is it a continuous review plan? We will look at providing delivery information to customers because customer service will be a perceived understanding from the customer's point of view of how well we have satisfied their requirements. So we should be able to tell the customer how well we can, when we can deliver their product. And in light of that, if we have satisfied uh, that requirement, then the customer would perceive our customer their customer service to be pretty good. So that's part of our intermediate term support activities. We have to communicate requirements to suppliers because at times the suppliers are the ones who are actually manufacturing for the organization. And finally, planning capacity to determine employment levels, budgets, overtimes, subcontracting. So there are several ways in which we are managing our capacity. All that has to be done on almost a monthly basis, weekly basis sometimes, depending upon the product life cycle. So that would be the intermediate term support activities. And finally, we have this short term support activities and these are closely aligned with our back end or the, the execution part of manufacturing planning and control. This is where we are looking at detailed scheduling of resources. And we want to ensure that people are working on the right things based on whatever the plan was. We also want to track the use of resources. We have to ensure that the execution is happening as in uh, the way we were expecting it. And we have to provide information to managers, customers, and suppliers so that there's a feedback mechanism of what exactly is going on. Now, there are several areas that are influencing the manufacturing planning and control system design. The degree of supply chain integration, for example, would have a major impact on manufacturing planning and control system design. If an organization is tightly integrated with its suppliers and customers, in such a way that the customers are providing continuous information about demand, and that information can in turn be sent out to the suppliers, then there is a seamless integration of the manufacturing planning and control at the manufacturing company's site with that at the customer's and the supplier's site. That would be a high level of integration across the supply chain, which would impact the way the system has to be designed. Next, the customers, their roles and expectations. Sometimes the customers are expecting a lot of flexibility from an organization so that they can change the requirement at the very last moment, depending upon what their customers might be looking for. Now, to be able to manage such changes that come from customers, the manufacturing planning and control system should be uh, capable of such kinds of changes. It should be adept 
in being able to manage such changes. So customers' roles and expectations will impact the way the system has been designed, the way it can incorporate these information and then make the necessary changes so that everything can be uh, provided to the customer as per the changes. And finally, the needs of management. A lot of times organizations are continuously evaluating their strategy and changing. Uh, for example, they might introduce a new product. The fact that an organization has introduced a new product implies that the manufacturing planning and control system has to take into account this new product and how it's going to impact the older product and all the different capacities that were associated with that earlier product that they were selling. If the two products have to be made together, are there some commonalities? Are there some substitutabilities? Is it possible to make sure that this manufacturing planning and control system is taking into account any such changes that the management might be looking for? A lot of times management might be interested in focusing on cost cutting because of a lot of external factors and then the MPC has to respond to that requirement by reshaping different kinds of activities that was going on. So once again, there will be influence of needs of management on how MPC has to be designed and executed. Now coming to matching the manufacturing planning control system with the firm needs, it's important to recognize that organizational needs do not remain constant. So in this ca case, it's important for an organization to be able to ensure that the manufacturing planning control system is changing as and when competitive changes are happening, as and when customer expectations are changing, and as and when there are changes in suppliers, capabilities, internal needs, and things like that. So there are several ways by which MPC system is trying to match these changing customer needs. One of the trend is there is a lot of online data access and systems. Instead of keeping a lot of inventories, organizations are trying to make products based on the knowledge of how customers are actually using the product. So all this data warehousing, data mining, all this tremendous amount of data that exists in business world is helping organizations to create MPC system that match with these changing firm needs. Now, not many organizations have moved ahead very far in that direction, but still there are a lot of leading organizations who have started taking uh, important steps in recognizing the importance of this data which comes in and how it can help adapt the MPC system as they go forward. Now outsourcing as and when we move in that direction and a lot of times now we are talking about insourcing would have a major impact on the MPC system so that has to also be accounted for when we are matching the MPC system with the firm need. And then as I was mentioning earlier, changes in firm strategy should also be reflected in MPC systems. So if we move from a, a differentiation based strategy where our product was unique and we could claim a higher premium for that product to a strategy which is cost based because there are many more competitors who have come in then it's not a matter of just changing a strategy at the high level, but also making sure that all the systems that support this new strategy are also in place. So that means the MPC system for a manufacturing organization has to adapt to this changed reality. Now, MPC system can be classified into five distinct types. And this, as you can see here, is dependent on the time between successive units that you see on the x-axis 
and the number of subparts on the y-axis. So essentially, for a company which fits here, which is a flow-based system, oil and natural ga gas, for example, the successive units that come out of the manufacturing site are coming out in a matter of seconds. Whereas a company which is in this position, which is a project-based organization, you'll find that the products are separated out in terms of months, as is probably the case in airplane, shipbuilding, uh, companies that are project-based here. And in between, you have a range of companies from repetitive manufacturing to just-in-time manufacturing and to MRP, uh, Material Requirement Planning-based manufacturing processes. Now, what happens is that a company might start at this point as a project organization, a very unique product, but almost every organization is slowly moving in that, this direction given competitive pressure or their own strategy to be able to get as in, to get more and more customers for their products. Tesla, they started at this stage with very few cars that were being made and slowly they planned to increase the production of their cars and want to be in the mass market for cars over time. What that means is that over time, the product itself is shifting or the MPC itself is also shifting from a project kind of manufacturing planning and control system to something which would be more reflective of a repetitive kind of system. Now, when we say that an MPC can be classified into these five types, what does that mean? What really it means is that based on what kind of MPC we have, the emphasis on different modules within the framework will be different. So we started looking at MPC in the first few slides by considering these three different phases or three different aspects, the front end, the engine, and the back end. Now, as we are moving in this classification schema, the importance of modules like sales and operations planning versus execution system would be different based on what kind of an organization it is. So if it's a flow-based company, a chemical plant, oil and natural gases, food industry. Now in this continuous production environment, the important aspect is the actual execution, the actual scheduling of machines. And hence, the back end is the most critical aspect of the manufacturing planning and control system. Now, on the other hand, when we go to the other end of the schema, which is project-based organization, here we have unique products, long duration, uh, and therefore the important thing is to be able to see do we have the necessary capacity to get this product made, which means that our focus is more on the front end in terms of the overall resource planning to ensure that we have the resources and then everything else uh, goes f further from there. Uh, but that is the most important thing. In between, if we are in repetitive environment, long production cycles, automotive industry, for example, in that case, we have a product which has been uh, planned uh, to go through multiple machines. There is an assembly line within which an automotive uh, company has to operate. The automobile has to go through that assembly line. So what we have to look at is the manufacturing uh, master production schedule of this company, as in how many products have to be made and do we have the necessary parts? So MRP and MPS, the integration between the two becomes very important. And likewise, in just-in-time, the MRP uh, system, all, all of these, we are really looking at the integration between the MPS and the engine, uh, how well 
a company can integrate them. So that's where this kind of a setup will be different from a flow or a project based setup. Now the evolution of MPC system, as we had already discussed, the MPC system must adapt to changing customer needs, changing company needs. Therefore, it's important to have periodic audits to see if the system's performance is in line with what exactly the requirements of the marketplace are. Because a lot of times we have set up an MPC system with a certain performance focus, but that performance variable is changing. For example, a differentiation strategy would mean customization of a product and very high customer service, but over time, if we are moving from that strategy to a cost strategy, the performance variable is now cost, which means that unless we go through an audit of the system, of the MPC system, we would not know if the system itself is delivering products in line with this new performance variable. So therefore, we have to ensure that we are taking into account such kind of changes by means of periodic audits. So there are various performance measures that could be there. We could have a performance variable as an equipment utilization because we want to make sure that we have all these different machines and they are utilized at their most optimal level. So that could be one example of a performance indicator. On the other hand, the indicator could be outputs. You know, it could be the typical productivity of an organization. How many outputs can we produce for the set inputs that we have? That could be another way by which we could look at our overall production, our overall performance. Then you can focus on the costs associated with different departments, different products, the labor utilization, and the project conditions. So there could be a complete focus on cost as in, are we using a lot of overtime labor? Are we um, spending this uh, enormous amount of time in a certain department at the expense of the overall cost for the product? All these things become very important as a part of our performance indicator. And then we have customer satisfaction as measured in terms of late deliveries, any returns that we might have because of quality issues any quantity errors, less than what was expected, more than what was expected. So this is where the link between our MPS, the master production schedule, and uh, the MRP, uh, if there's a mismatch between the two, or a link between demand planning and sales and operations planning, if there's a mismatch between the two, we'll see customer satisfaction will be affected. So we are interested in all these different kinds of performance indicators and we actually want to consider all of them together to understand how well the MPC system is performing. And once we have an idea of how we are doing and how we should be doing, we may know whether the MPC system has to be changed or maintained the way it is. So that's where I think I will stop and this overview provides us a basis for subsequent discussions where we will go f in further details about sales and operations planning, master production scheduling, material requirement planning, and try to understand the overall framework a little bit more in detail. Thanks.